Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to welcome you to Crossroads. I'm so glad that you're with us today. I want to welcome those who are watching at home as well. Always a joy to come into your home. And you're welcome to take out the message outlines that are found right in your program. You could also follow along on the church app. For those at home, the notes are in the, the links as well. We're continuing our message series, Think Healthy, Live Healthy. And what we've been saying these last couple of weeks together is that there's a battle raging on, in case we haven't realized it yet, is a battle that's taking place between our ears. And whether it's stress, discouragement, whether it's hardship, uh, whether it's just negativity, whatever it might be, um, it's important to realize that God has given us the ammunition uh, and the weapon tree so that we could push forward and push through whatever that might be, uh, because God wants us to live from a mind that is healthy and obviously not filled with nonsense, but filled with his promises. And today I want to talk with you about a particular message that uh, it's relevant to me, maybe because we've been teaching about this stuff the last, I don't know, 10 weeks. I want to talk with you about tuning out the voices of discouragement. And listen, I don't know if this applies to you today, but I've been having these voices of discouragement. So I'm going to give this message to me and you can listen in since you're here. Okay. All right. Uh, but maybe you have had from time to time uh, that voice or voices of discouragement. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, right here in the top of your outline, uh, we've listed it here. What are these discouraging voices, okay? Uh, discouraging voices can be people, problems, pain, or past mistakes. Now, here's the key. Don't miss this. That make you think that discouragement is a permanent condition and not a temporary challenge. Now, don't miss that. Uh, the discouraging voices want you to think that the discouragement that you're going through, that's a permanent condition. In other words, it's never going to change. Uh, this person's never going to maybe come to the Lord, or this problem's never going to go away, or this pain is never going to be lifted, or there's never going to be a breakthrough, that this chain is never going to be broken, or this can't possibly happen. And so what we must realize is, is God doesn't want us to see discouragement as our lot in life, or again, as this permanent resident in our mind. Rather, it's a temporary challenge. Now, why is it important to think that way? Well, in case you haven't noticed yet, if you don't tune out those voices of discouragement, they will quickly, I mean, within a blink of an eye, become thoughts of negativity. And those thoughts of negativity will produce a mind of negativity. And a mind of negativity will produce an attitude of negativity. And we sink and we sabotage ourselves from there. I'm so thankful that God has given to us within his word, uh, without question, the wisdom and the tools that we can not just tolerate uh, the voices of negativity and discouragement, but we can tune them out. And so I want to direct your attention uh, to the first chapter, um, I'm sorry, the, the first book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And as you find your place there, we're going to be looking at one of the most famous battles in the Old Testament. Interestingly enough, this battle is not between two nations, it's not between two armies, it's actually between two people. And it's probably the most famous story, even to people outside the Bible, maybe even other than the, the crucifixion and the resurrection, and the birth of Christ, and I'm talking about the battle, the infamous battle between David and Goliath. Even if you're not familiar with the Bible, maybe you like sports or you watch movies, an underdog story, they always use that in the vernacular, right? A true David versus Goliath story. Now, why that was, was because in comparison, uh, David, when you size him up, the tail of the tape, um, to Goliath, I mean, he was greatly undersized and really overmatched when you think about it. And as you come and approach this story, what we're going to see is, is that this massive man, Goliath, who is really taunting the people of Israel, um, he was providing enough discouragement to go around for everybody. And this certainly was a challenge. And so from this story, we will see discouragement on full display but also how we might tune it out and in the process overcome it. Because if we just get up here and just say, hey, just think positive, uh, the problem will go away tomorrow. That doesn't always happen, right? Be great if it did. Or listen, the sun's going to come out tomorrow. Well, the sun could be out tomorrow, but you could still be discouraged. And so again, whether it's people, whether it's problems that you're going through, past mistakes or pain, 
The voices of discouragement can be very loud, especially in the darkness of the night, but by God's grace, we can overcome them. And so turn with me, if you haven't done so already, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And for the sake of time, we'll jump around with some of these verses here. And we're going to start out by looking at the size of Goliath, the size of the discouragement, if you will. Starting in verse 4, let me read it to you and then we'll break it down. This is what we're told. It says, And there came out from the camp of the Philistines, who were at this juncture in history, by the way, the quote-unquote opponent of the Israelites, their enemies. It says, a champion named Goliath of Goth, whose height was six cubits and a span. And so we're introduced to this character named Goliath, and we're given a measurement here that we may not be familiar with. So let's put in our lingo and uh, let's understand it in our, our reckoning of measurements. We're told he's six cubits and a span. And when you study ancient history and how they measured time and how they, they measured height and distance and so forth and on, um, Goliath was nearly as tall as a regulation basketball hoop. He stood at an imposing nine feet, nine inches. I mean, that's crazy. Okay, he could play center on any basketball team um, in the world. And with his wingspan, could you imagine how just enormous this, I'm going to invent a word with you today, ginormous this man was. Um, and so he's the champion of the Philistines because in ancient times, uh, before they would go to like an all-out battle between armies, they would say, we're going to take our best fighter and you bring your best fighter and let's see who wins. Well, obviously, Goliath was undefeated, okay, uh, especially at this size, but it doesn't stop there. He wasn't just a tall twig. Look what verse 5 says. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and, which is heavy, by the way, and he was armed with something called a coat of mail. And well, when you study Eastern history, you find out that this coat of mail uh, had metal on and other objects on it. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. You couldn't get this at Burlington Coat Factory or Amazon Wardrobe. Um, 5,000 shekels, how much did that weigh? Well, when you study and you reckon the measurements there, it weighed anywhere from 175 to 200 pounds. That might be more than some of what you, you weigh here today, okay? I mean, think about that. So he's, so he's a strong man. If he's carrying around armor that weighs 200 pounds, I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. Now listen to some of his weaponry, verse 6. And he had uh, bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. Verse 7, the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron which was approximately 20 to 25 pounds, okay? You start thinking about not only was this man tall, this man was extremely strong, and it says, and his shield bearer went before him. So in other words, he had somebody who must have been, must have been strong himself to be carrying at least a nine foot or 10 foot tall shield just to protect him from arrows because most likely when this guy fought, maybe sometimes it was one on 10 because he was so big. And so he has somebody going before him with the shield. Now don't miss verse eight here. It says this, he stood and finish it with me shouted to the ranks of Israel. Now that word shouted, interestingly enough, what it's conveying is, is he was taunting the people of Israel. And as we read on in this chapter, he's mocking God, my God and your God. Um, he's mocking the people. He's shouting obscenities. There's nothing but discouragement that's spewing from his mouth. And this is certainly a challenge and a topic that is prevalent in this particular chapter. And so you'll notice here, it didn't stop, but here it says, Goliath, he tried to discourage the Israelites. That's verses eight and nine. But there was also more discouragement. Um, Eliab, which was the older brother of David, who we're gonna be reintroduced to here in just a moment, who would fight Goliath, he tried to discourage his brother. Saul tried to discourage his brother. We'll read about that specifically. And then of course, when it came time for Goliath and David to square off, uh, Goliath was trying to discourage David as well. All of this discouragement, what are we to do with it? Well, let me tell you what we're to do with it. We're not to let it conquer us. You might say, how do you know that? Well, there's a command in the Bible that's repeated over and over again. You know what it is? And it comes together. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. God says that repeatedly. It's not a suggestion. 
It's not a recommendation. It's not a positive pep talk. It's a command because God knows we need it. We're going to have problems again. We're going to have pains. We're going to have pressures. We're going to have difficult people and so forth and on. And these things will discourage us. We're going to have unanswered prayers. We're going to have situations that do absolutely do not make sense. And they discourage us. And when they do, God doesn't want us to stay in that discouragement. He wants us to tune it out and to overcome it. And I believe the story of David and Goliath provides a blueprint for any of us when discouragement darkens our door, uh, we don't have to invite it in. Just before the service, I was talking with a few of our lovely members, and they were talking about some of the scams that are going on today. People knocking on your door saying you have a roof problem. They might want to kick your door in and do something to you, or they might want to go on your roof, create a problem, charge you money, run away with the money, do nothing about it. There was something over here in the New Door Pipes area about two months ago, somebody claiming to come fix pipes that were clogged. They kicked the door in, tried to assault the homeowner. Lots of scams out there. You don't want to let discouragement in. Discouragement is a big scam from the pits of hell. And you don't want to entertain it. You certainly don't want to invite it in your home. So how, or your head for that matter, so how do we get through it? Well, let's jump here to, I believe, a section of this story. Again, this is a famous story. Everybody's heard of David and Goliath. But this first thing that we want to look at here is something that's often overlooked. But I believe it provides the foundation for overcoming discouragement in your life and my life. And so jumping here to verse 17, again, for the sake of time, this is what we're told. It says, And Jesse said to David, his son, Take for your brothers an ephod of this parchment grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Verse 18, also take 10 cheeses to the commander of their thousand and see if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. So what's going on here? Well, David at this juncture in his life is tending the sheep. His three older brothers have been drafted, enlisted, if you will, into the battle, into the war, into Israel's army. They're on the battlefield. And Jesse, David's father, David's anywhere between 16 and 19 at this stage. Uh, Jesse, David's father, says, go take your brothers some lunch. So long before there was DoorDash, there was David Dash, okay? David's taking sandwiches. That's what this is, a basket of sandwiches David Dash coming out here, and he's taking food to his brother. Now, his brothers. Now, you might go, what is that? Let's, let's get to the rocks and knocking David down, okay? Don't miss this detail. David is obeying the chain of command, his father. David's being faithful with the task that is before him. It might not seem heavy. You know what? Uh, give me a spear. Give me a shield. Put me on the front lines. No, no. You go take some sandwiches to your brothers. Now, write this first principle down. It will become, without question, one of the most important tools in your entire Christian life. And here it is. Be faithful with my little assignments. Can you say that with me? Be faithful with my little assignments. You might look at it as insignificant, but God just might use. Now, listen to this. Don't miss this. David, think about it contextually here, okay? Uh, please, let me have your attention here, okay? Uh, think about it this way. Had David said to his father, I don't want to take the sandwiches. I'll do it when I want to do it. David might have missed his destiny. This is going to thrust David on to the scene. He's already, we know he's going to be the king and he's already going to be, he's already been anointed. We understand that. But what if David would have said, you know what? I don't want to do this. I want a better job. I don't got time for this. I'll do it when I want to do it. His disobedience might have delayed his destiny. Your obedience will always put you where God wills for you to be. And this little thing of taking the sandwiches thrusted David to right where he needed to be. And it would eventually, obviously, lead to him being king. See, that day, it put David where he needed to be to take on Goliath. And if you think about it, had David not taken the sandwiches, he would have never went to this valley. He would have never been where God wanted him to be. What little things is God calling you to do that if you just do them, they're going to thrust you right where God wants you to be? They're going to put you right in position of blessing. They're going to put you in your purpose. Obviously, they're going to take you out of the nonsense maybe you were in. 
Maybe it's going to put you in a place of peace, a greater understanding of his grace and mercy. Maybe God's going to open some doors if I just obey and do what God has called me to do. And this is a principle that is seen throughout the scriptures. Look what Jesus said in Luke's gospel. This is part of a parable, but it's incredible wisdom here. Why don't we say this verse together aloud? A great verse to commit to memory. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in larger ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest in greater things. You know, you want to be a person that looks at every task that God gives to you. Uh, it could be work, family, um, school, athletics, whatever it might be, that God is using that to mold me into the person that he has planned for me to be. I don't want to treat anything in God's plan as insignificant. Again, contextually here, look at David. Had David shoved his father's command off, it might have delayed what God wanted to do for him. I believe it would have because God, see, we have to understand something. The currency of heaven is obedience, is faithfulness. When you're faithful to God, you can never outgive God. When you're obedient and faithful to God, God loves, like a parent, loves to bless his children. And he's going to bless David exponentially. See, it's not about necessarily chronological maturity. It is about spiritual maturity. And faithfulness and obedience will help you grow, listen, exponentially. I heard the story about a young aspiring entrepreneur who approached a seasoned businessman who had successfully started several Fortune 500 companies and was doing very, very well for himself. He asked how he could one day after the seminar that the businessman taught, how could he one day become as influential and as well known and as well set up as he was financially? The businessman responded and I quote, don't waste your time chasing get rich quick schemes and certainly never cut corners compromising your integrity, nor go looking for large opportunities which may never come to pass, but faithfully handle the little things that are always claiming your attention, like work, school, your home life, family, and friends. For these things will yield the discipline that is necessary to achieve your dreams and more, and most importantly, this is the mindset that honors God and helps others best the little things. What assignments has God placed in your lap? What assignments are in front of you? Let's stop pushing them off. God wants to use those little assignments to put you where you need to be. And it's vital that we understand it that way. You know, before we move on to our next point, I read this book and I actually quoted some of this book in um, one of the chapters in the Think Healthy, Live Healthy devotional, I think it may have been day three or four, about tackling one task at a time. And the reason why there, that is, is because there is a medical, whole neuro, neurological science behind this, making sure people then get caught up trying to multitask their life too much. Now, there's a lot of pride in multitasking, right? I could do all these things at once, I'm multitasking. But we run the risk of that saying, you know that saying, right? Um, We're a jack of all trades and a master of none. And so uh, Admiral, retired uh, Navy Admiral, four-star Navy Admiral William McGavin um, wrote this book called Make Your Bed. It's a great book, um, and I highly recommend it, and I quoted it in my writing, um, and he talks about the power of conquering a task to start your day and how that task could help you complete other tasks in your life. And he really uses that, and he actually spoke about it in his 2014 um, commencement address at the University of Austin in Texas. And he talks about making your bed, that if you can get off to a good start making your bed, that'll help you become disciplined in every other area of your life. And I think there's some truth to that. Um, without question, there's medical science to support that. We want to be people who are doing our best to be faithful with the little assignments that God has given to us. And like David, God will position us to be where we need to be. Now, how does that connect to discouragement? Well, the next time discouragement comes speaking loudly at you, when you're being faithful to God, you're gonna have a confidence like no other. Maybe you've noticed that. See, when you're not walking right with God, well, the voices of discouragement are louder. 
Have you noticed that as well? You know, when you think about the geography of this battle, let me just uh, remind you of this. They're in this valley, and it's more like a canyon, this ravine that they're in. And Goliath is yelling at them through the valley, and sometimes your problems will yell at you. Have you noticed that? Um, your discouragement will yell at you. Your discouragement will mock you. And it can, without question, discourage, deplete, distract, and disconnect you every time. However, when you're being faithful to God with the assignments he's given to you, big and small, what happens is it produces a holy confidence and contentment, and it drowns out, it tunes out the voices of the enemy and those who might be trying to come against you. Never discount the importance of faithfulness. God is calling you and I to be faithful to him with our assignments. Now, let me ask you a question before we move on. Can we trust God? Yes or no? Yes. Can trust God. Coming here each week is not about convincing anybody uh, that we could trust God, because I think that is implicitly true. You know what the better question to ask about our spiritual maturity is, can God trust us? Could God trust us maybe with more wealth? Could God trust us with more influence? Could God trust us with more position? Could God trust us with our family? Could God trust us with leadership in the church? Could God trust me to do this? Could God trust me to do that? You know, we pray for these big things, but the better question is, God, can, God help me to be a trustworthy person. That's the better prayer, actually. God, I want to be a trustworthy person. That's why I want to commend you, those who serve maybe the children's ministry. We hear some of them teaching right now, being faithful, taking care of the babies, ushers, greeters, security, uh, worship team, women's ministry, men's ministry, children's ministry, youth group. I mean, you name it. Thank God for those who serve. You might go, well, that, it's not really a big deal. It's just an hour on a Sunday. Nonsense. It's very important to the kingdom of God. And as you're faithful, that becomes a, a a piece of courage and your own shield as the discouraging voices come your way. God wants to bless you and I, but can we be trusted? Can we be trusted with what God wants to give to us? David could at this part of his life. I pray the same is said for me and you. As you flip over here, um, the next section of verses, I want to give you the, the point right away, just so we could uh, ruminate it in our minds. And it goes like this. Pay attention to the voice of truth. Doesn't that just sound good, right? All right? Can we say that together? Pay attention to the voice of truth. See, the voice of truth is speaking to you and I. And where is the voice of truth? What number do I call? And um, is it on the internet? Where could I get it? Um, well, here's the voice of truth. It's the word of God. And the Word of God, what happens is, is the, the Word of God is His voice to you and to me. And when discouragement comes, God will impress upon my heart and your heart what He has already written. And that is why it's important that we do the best we can. Nobody's asking anybody to be um, some type of scholar or anything like that. But we do the best we can to put God's Word into our hearts and our minds so that when those discouraging voices come, oh, this is never going to happen. Oh, this is this is oh, this can't possibly happen. You're getting too old, or you're getting to this and to that. When the negativity and discouragement comes, God will oppress upon your heart that He's the God of miracles. That He's the God. Listen, He He opens up wombs, He opens up eyes, He opens up ears, and guess what? He opens up graves. That's what He does. And so I want to pay attention to what the voice of truth is saying then. I don't want to get caught up in the voices of nonsense and discouragement and prognostication. I want to know what God's word says. And so let's just look, continue looking at the story here. Jumping to verse 32, we'll look at verse 32, 33, and 37 in this section here of the voice of truth. David now brings the sandwiches. We know that. He does his little day, door, David dash. He drops off the sandwiches. He now sees what's going on, and guess what? He hears what's going on. He hears Goliath shouting insults to God. He's mocking God. That doesn't sit well with David. You know, every time Goliath comes out, he's been doing it for 40 days, we find out. Every time Goliath comes out, you know what everybody else does? They run away from the fight. Guess what David's going to do? He's going to run to the fight. You know why that is? Because when you're walking right with God, when you're faithful to God, when you're completing your assignments, you're not scared of nothing. That's why. 
And that's what David does. David has a confidence right now. It's not in himself because if it was in himself, he'd be running like the rest of them. But when you are walking right with God, you have a faith to get out of the boat. You have a faith to charge the hill here. You have a faith to stand up to a man who's nine feet, nine inches tall, whose body armor probably weighs more than you. And that's what's going on here. So then David now comes there. Listen to what he says to King Saul. Now remember, Saul is the king. By the way, Saul himself is tall, okay? Um, so David says to Saul, Saul, tall, tall Saul, whatever you want to call him, everyone want to remember him. David said to tall Saul, King Saul, don't let anyone, listen to this, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible translation, uh, don't let anyone be discouraged by him, by Goliath. Don't let anybody be discouraged by this freak in nature here. Don't let anybody be discouraged by him. We don't need to be fearful of him. Look what David says next. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Now, Saul must be thinking, wait a minute, you? He's already been passed over earlier. Remember when they were coming to anoint the next king, they were picking all the brothers. And then, is there anybody else? Samuel says, yeah, David, he's out tending the sheep. He's a nobody. But apparently he's a somebody. He might be ordinary to other people, but remember what God said earlier in this same book. He said, man looks on the outward appearance, but God sees the what? The heart. What is God seeing? He sees the faithfulness. That's what he sees. He sees who could be trusted. That's what he sees. And so he's looking here and he sees David. So David says, I'll go fight the Philistine. Now, verse 33, Saul's going to discourage him here. Now, there are going to be people in your life who they mean well, and they just can't help but to be discouraging. Kind of reminds me of my favorite episode of The Honeymooners, a matter of record, when Ralph has to give the apology and he's recording the record about Alice's mother being mean. And he says, she doesn't mean to be mean. She's just born that way, okay? All right. Some people, they don't mean to be discouraging. They're just born that way, okay? And I don't think Saul means anything malicious. Now, later on in this story, Saul wants to kill David, so that might be a different story. But right now, I don't think, I think Saul's being truthful here. But Saul replied, you can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth. You don't even have your driver's license. You're not even shaving yet, for crying out loud. And he's been a warrior since he was young. For crying out loud, he's nine foot nine. He probably came out of the womb three feet tall. He's been fighting since he's one years old in diapers. You're telling me you're going to fight this guy? He's undefeated. Are you kidding me? And somehow in this exchange, I think the Spirit of God gave Saul a comfort to send David because the fate of Israel rested on this battle here. If they lose, they become enslaved again, and now to the Philistines. So God must have given Saul as king the leadership to say, okay, David, and now look what verse 37 says. They have an exchange, and then David said, the Lord who rescued me from the poor of the lion and the poor of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. What is David doing here? What was David prior to this? He was a what? He, well, before he was doing David dash, he was doing what? He would tend to sheep, a shepherd. And shepherds have to protect their sheep from wolves and wild animals and so forth and on. And look who he gives the credit to God. Listen, I've, I've been taking care of my sheep and I have fought off bears and lions. And the Lord saw me through that. He's going to see me through this. What's he doing right now? He's remembering the voice of truth. And that's why this has been preserved. This is the voice of truth for me and for you. The voice of truth is a reminder that our God is faithful to protect us, that our God is faithful to provide, that our God will give us the power we need because his grace is, his grace is sufficient. It's made perfect in my weakness and in your weakness. And so we need the voice of truth to remind us that he is a, uh, is a God of abundance that he is a God of agility, that God can move, that God can help us pivot. He, he's a God of covering. He's a God of refuge. He's the God who's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It doesn't matter what the circumstances might be and how they might be changing. Our God is unchanging as well as his word. And so I want to pay attention to what the voice of truth is saying because the truth has an unmatched, unparalleled, and unique power. You may have heard of it. Jesus said it in John chapter 8, verse 32. I want to invite you to say this verse with me together. And let me just say this before you get it ready here, is the next time, probably tonight, maybe in the middle of the night or whatever, the next time you're feeling discouraged, 
I want you to quote this verse. This is the voice of truth, the voice of Jesus. Here it is together. And you will know the, and the, will set you free. You've been saved not to be a slave. You've been saved to be set free. Discouragement, not only does discouragement want to hurt you when you're down about your problems, your grief, uh, your struggles, your addictions. It wants you to go back to something. Well, that's not God's will for you. The voice of truth says chains have been broken because I got a plan for you. The voice of truth says take the sandwiches to the valley because I got a purpose for you. The voice of truth says that I have good works for you to do that I planned before the foundations of the earth and not even the gates of hell could prevail against that. And so the voice of truth is speaking loudly. God's word. God will impress upon our hearts. And why was all this stuff written? Oh, the Bible, just a bunch of how to wear your hair and how to dress. No, that's not what it's about. Look what it says in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. We sang about this early in our beautiful worship. Listen to what it says. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago. Finish the next part with me. To teach us. Not to condemn us. To teach us. Finish it with me. And the scriptures give us hope and as we wait for God's to be fulfilled. That's what, these th that's what the voice of truth does. It helps you to keep on keeping on. The voice of truth is going to remind you um, that it, it, it does get dark, but joy comes in the morning. The voice of truth is going to remind you that he is the God of the impossible and he is the God who binds up the brokenhearted. He is the God who has saved you and I. He's not some statue, some religious figure or something of that nature, that God is alive and well sitting on his throne. We want to pay attention to the voice of truth. I'm sure you've heard that song by Casting Crowns once or twice. Here's part of it here. And don't worry, as you reach for your purses and jackets, I'm not going to sing it, okay? All right. Oh, that wasn't nice to laugh at that. I wasn't trying to, be, trying to be funny. Take it easy over there, okay? Especially, especially this section over here. Right over here. Uh, you got to talk to this section. Remind me later. Listen to this part of the song. But the giant's calling out my name, and he laughs at me reminding me all the times I've tried before and failed. The giant keeps on telling me time and time again, boy, you'll never win. You'll never win. But the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth says, do not be afraid. And the voice of truth says, this is for my glory. Out of all the voices calling out to me, I will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth. What voices are you listening to today? You need to tune out the voices of discouragement and listen to the voice of truth. Where does God want you to be? What does he want you to do? What is the voice of truth saying to me and to you? You know, sometimes we think the voice of truth is always telling us what we want to hear. The voice of truth might be saying, listen, you need to, you need to come, you need to repent. Um, the voice of truth might be saying, listen, I know it's dark right now. I know it seems like there's no hope, but you keep believing, don't stop praying. The voice of truth might be saying, don't give up. The voice of truth might be saying, you need this or you need that. But you just want to keep paying attention to the voice of truth. Because guess what the Bible says the voice of God is like? It says that it roars in Psalm 29.3 over the ocean. Let me tell you something. God's voice is going to roar over your stormy waters as well. You listen for the voice of truth. Before we move on to the last point, I'm reminded of a scene from my favorite Rocky movie, Rocky IV. You know, Rocky, how many have seen Rocky IV? And Rocky V, 6, 7, 8, 10, 12, 24, right? But Rocky IV, I should have just stopped at four or five maybe, but that's okay. But Rocky IV, you remember after Apollo dies in the ring by the hands of their own Goliath, Drago, uh, one of the next scenes after the towel drops and then he's in the ring holding Apollo is there's a press conference and Rocky's going to fight Drago. And the fight is scheduled for Christmas Day. It's in Russia. Um, you probably remember the scene well. Well, after that, he goes home to tell Adrian. By the way, the study of, um, and John Palumbo and I have talked about this, <laughs> is that the study of Rocky and Adrian, you probably do a marriage seminar on that. I mean, I mean, really, I mean, 
he's really, he's really kind to her. She's kind to him. I mean, it's fascinating. Well, he should, probably should have told her he was going to do this fight, but he didn't. But he comes home and she saw the press conference. And you remember the scene. She, and if you haven't, you go home and watch it. But she's, she's on the top of the stairs and he's on the bottom of the stairs. And she saw the press conference and they start dialoguing about it. And she says something to him that it caused him to like turn his head and like you saw the look, because he's a fighter. You saw the look of the fighter, the eye of the tiger. She said this, and I quote, you can't win. And the look in his eyes when she said that, and he didn't yell at her, he didn't curse at her or anything like that. This is when movies were clean, right? Um, he, he, he said, oh, Adrian always tells the truth. And they exchanged a few more back and forth. And he said, listen, if he's gonna beat me, it's gonna have to kill me. And right after that, a few more things are said, and then it cuts to the scene where he jumps in his, um, I think it was a 1981 uh, Lamborghini Japal, and he jumps in and he starts up the car and he starts going and the song by Survivor comes on, there's no easy way out. There's no shortcuts home. Let me tell you something. There's no easy way to overcome discouragement, but there's a way through. And the way through is with the voice of truth. Everybody else might be saying you can't win. Everybody else, listen, might be saying it can't be done. Everybody else might be saying this time has passed or such and forth, which you must remember is God redeems time, by the way. God will pay you back double, we see in the scripture. God will open doors where there are closed doors. God will close doors where they need to be closed. And God will pave the way where it needs to be paved. We already know he parts Red Seas and he opens graves. And so he could do what he needs to do in my life and in your life. Again, he specializes in the miraculous. And the last time I checked, there's been no notice from heaven that says, stop believing God for miracles. Pay attention to the voice of truth. No matter who's telling you, you can't win. Because God is saying, you can. Because you could do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Goliath when you look at the tail of the tape, had an incredible size advantage in terms of stature. But Goliath was a midget when it came to his faith. David had an incredible faith at this juncture of his life. Again, anywhere between the age of 16, I'm putting him at 16, maybe 17 actually, 16 to 19 years of age, and just incredible faith here. And so we know how the story ends. Spoiler alert, David's gonna drop him. We understand that. But let's jump here to verse 45. Now it's going to come time for David and Goliath to square off. Then David said to the Philistine, you've come to me with a sword and a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you, finish it with me, in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Now he don't remain, don't forget that. That's important here. Who you, You've mocked God. You've tried to discourage us. You've, you've mocked my God. You've defiled my God's name by what you have said. And guess what? You've come against him. And I don't come to you with your weaponry. I can't even carry your weaponry, okay? I don't come to you with your weaponry. I don't have a drone or anything like that. I'm going to drop a bomb on you. No, no, no. I come to you with the man who commands the armies of the Lord. I come with the man himself, he's saying. And whenever you see this in the Old Testament, it speaks of the legions of angels that come with God. And God is the commander of such armies. David knows the battle belongs to the Lord. See, when you go through discouragement, you got to remember that battle don't belong to you. The battle belongs to you, we're going to lose. The battle belongs to the Lord. Well, guess what? We know how that's going to work out. And that's what David says. Now, verse 46, this day, finish this declaration out of David's mouth with me. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. Now, that's exactly what happens. David in that ravine gets a few stones and he throws a fastball, hits Goliath right in the head and drops him. Now, is it that David had an incredible arm? Maybe he had a good arm, but I don't think that was it. I think the power in David's arm was God Almighty. And God's going to put a power in your swing as well. He's going to put a power in your arms to raise your hands to pray. He's going to put a power in your feet to get on the path that you need to be on. He's going to clean out some of that stinking thinking so that the things of God could occupy your mind and that you don't give up. It was Henry Ford who said it this way, 
whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. It's a matter of the mind. Fill your mind with the things of God. Remember that you're a king's kid. You're blood bought. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and not anything in hell could take that away from you and from me. And it's important that we keep these things in mind because up until this point, the people of Israel, they kept anticipating what? Defeat. Here comes David. He's anticipating victory. So if you haven't guessed it already, write this last principle down as we close. Very important if you're going to tune out the voices of negativity and discouragement together. Here it is. Shift my anticipation from defeat to victory. How do some people live? Uh, Murphy's Law, okay, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. The last time I checked, we don't go by Murphy's Law. We go by God's law and what God has said. I'm going to go by that. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to anticipate defeat. I'm not going to anticipate that it's not going to work out. I'm going to anticipate that it's going to work out just as God has willed it to work out. Just in his timing, how he wants it. It's not always going to make sense. But I'm going to trust that God will make a way where there is no way. I don't need some, you know, religious positive talk or go through the motions because it's Lent to get me through another day. No, no, I'm not living in survival mode. God has saved me to thrive as his child, whether I'm in the valley or I'm on top of the mountain. And the last time I checked, we have a mandate to shift all our attention from defeat to victory, to anticipate victory. I would go as far to say, that's what God has called me and you to do because he wants to put the wind of the Holy Spirit at your back. As we close, before we read our last verse, how many of you seen the movie uh, Facing the Giants? Anybody see that movie? Great man. Some of you got to get a life, but, uh, but uh, um, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Great movie. Came out some years ago. Go ahead and watch that. Listen, I planned your whole afternoon for you, okay? All right? You should just send me a thank you note or something. But uh, Facing the Giants, great Christian movie about football. And I love this scene in the movie. They're playing for the state championship, and it's coming down to a field goal. In football, um, a field goal is worth three points, and they're getting ready to kick the field goal. And this kicker, who must weigh maybe 125 pounds soaking wet with his football equipment on, he's lining up for the kick. Now, his father is confined to a wheelchair. He has some form of paralysis that has um, obviously has uh, rendered him to not be able to walk. And so he has his wheelchair uh, near the fence, not too far from where the goalpost is. And in the, I mean, it's an incredible scene. I got actually, I think I showed this many years ago. I got to show it again, maybe this Father's Day. It's an incredible scene. The father uses all of his strength to get up and he stands up and then he makes the sign because this is a sign... This the field goal is good or a touchdown is good. He starts making this sign. Well, his son's, and he's praying while he's doing it. Well, as he's standing up, one of the security comes over because you're technically not supposed to be there. He says, sir, um, you got to sit down. What are you doing? He says, leave me alone. I'm standing for my son. I mean, it's an incredible line, incredible scene. And he's up there doing that. Now his son sees his father standing like this. The father hasn't stood in a long time. His son then says a prayer, something to the effect of, God, help me to make this kick. It was going to be an impossible kick. Well, just as he prays that, the father's standing like this, praying, a major wind starts blowing. Not against him, but coming with the kick. The coach starts yelling, kick the ball, kick the ball. And he puts his whole body into the kick, and it sails right through the uprights, yeah. and it's good. Told you it's a good movie. <laughs> you can anticipate victory because your father's standing for you. Your father sent his son, Jesus Christ, and he put his arms up. He put them like this for you and for me. There's no other name by which we could be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. There's lots of great benevolent um, religion, religious expressions in the world today. I've had the privilege of studying many of them, visiting their places of worship. But I could tell you unequivocally, there is only one Savior who went to the cross for me and for you, and that is Jesus Christ. And he went to the cross for me and for you. And by doing this, like that father, he's telling you, you can anticipate victory because the same power that rose Christ from the dead lives in me and lives in you. By his stripes, we are healed. You have to remember that. 
You have to remember that the story doesn't end with the cross, though. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. We have every reason by faith to trust God for the victory because he defeated the grave. As we close, and how appropriate with the celebration of Resurrection Sunday in two weeks. Look what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, known as the Resurrection Chapter, chapter 15, verse 57. Why don't we say this verse together aloud? This is the voice of truth, God's voice, okay, together. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe that today? I pray you do. I pray that you, you take every assignment God gives to you seriously. You never know how he's going to use it to thrust you where you need to be. I pray that you pay attention to the voice of truth. It's roaring. Just pay attention. God wants to guide you, direct you. He doesn't want you to give up in the valley. I know you might have some Goliath-sized problems that are discouraging you right now, some things that are really breaking your heart. But God is greater, and he'll see you through. Don't give up. And most importantly, as a child of God, anticipate the victory because of the cross and the resurrection. I pray you receive it today. Let's pray, okay? Our Father and our God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for the story of David and Goliath, the foreshadowing of the incredible defeat of death and sin on that Friday and that resurrection Sunday. Thank you, O oh God, that you overcome the odds every time. I pray for those who are here today, O oh God, who are waiting on a miracle, or maybe it's a healing God physically. Maybe it's a broken heart because of somebody they've lost. Maybe it's for a sick child. Maybe it's waiting for a child to, uh, for the, to be born into the family. Maybe it's a broken family. Maybe it's broken promises, broken dreams. God, thank you that you are the God of all comfort and mercy. We pray your mercy would be upon these. We pray for those who might struggle with anxiety, depression, God, of any kind, any battle between the ears, O oh God. We pray the voice of truth, O oh God, would quietly whisper to them today not to give up. And Lord, for all of us, thank you for the cross and the resurrection. We want to anticipate the victory. We thank you. And we sow these prayers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.